So finally got a day back in the office where I can pull together a lot of the footage I've captured over the last few weeks working with a fisheries, going out and joining them on a few little jobs and it should be a good representation this, uh, of some of the challenges we come up against when we're out working on fisheries, stock surveying and some of the population management work that we do. Obviously each lake, we go to a different lake each day and each lake is a different challenge. Some of them are very easy, some of them are very straightforward and others are very challenging. I think the last few jobs that I've been with Andrew, they've all been a bit challenging. So I think this could be a good video just to show you some of the challenge we, challenges we face and the difficulties we come up against and how we get around them. So uh, without further ado, let's get stuck into vlog number six, which started off at Landridod Wells in, uh, in Wales. And this is the park lake, they had uh, a big sort of feature, a big, big uh, dragon feature in the middle of the lake. And uh, traveling up to there, it was, it was a violently cold day. It was absolutely freezing. And uh, to, be, to be honest, on the way to the job, I thought there's no way we're gonna be netting this lake because uh, it's so bloody cold, it's bound to be frozen. Andy did say that he'd spoken to the guys there the previous day and said it has got a bit of ice on it and it only got colder. So I thought, surely we're not gonna be netting it. And we turned up and sure enough, the whole lake was completely frozen. I thought, ah, oh, we'll be going home early today. I don't think there's any chance we'll be, uh, we'll be tackling that because when we got out and had a look at the thickness of the ice, it was uh, up to sort of 10 mil, so it was, pretty substantial sheet of ice um, and with ice is sort of uh, it's, it's crap if it's too thin because it just breaks up and blocks up the net and it's a nightmare to sort out when you've caught the fish and uh, when you when you land the net you just when you've got a load of thin ice it just breaks up and gets in the way but when it's too thick obviously you can't break it so uh, there's a happy medium where it can be done and it's actually not too bad as long as there's no snags you can pull the, the net underneath the ice and you can uh, poke the floats underneath the ice and eventually you can push the sheet of ice to one side and net it like normal but it does take a lot longer which is a nightmare but yeah turning up to Landrodod Wells uh, I really didn't think we'd be netting that lake but uh, that's fuel to the fire for Andy if you tell him it can't be done he's more uh, he's got that attitude where he, he's gonna do it uh, and obviously with a park lake normally those are the worst ones for snags because people obviously chucking stuff in chucking sticks in for the dogs There'll be trolleys, bikes, you find all sorts in Park Lakes. So yeah, I thought this is this is one that's uh, gonna be a long old day. But more and more people would gather, because it's a park, obviously people walking their dogs, Not, more and more people gathered to uh, to watch what we were doing and asking questions and seeing what we were up to. And uh, yeah, we nailed all, loads and loads of fish that, that sweep. Um, and I think everyone was, was was impressed with what we did there. We had a good, good survey of the stock, seeing what's going on. And uh, yeah, that was quite rewarding after such a long day of, um, being in the absolute freezing cold, putting nets under ice, we uh, got the reward in the end. And uh, yeah, thankfully it was all worthwhile. So the next job was right up north in the Wirral for Old Kiln Angling. Uh, and these were some big brick pits. So uh, we had a couple of days doing some stock assessments and surveys, removing juveniles up from these brick pits. But uh, in their very nature, these quarries, they're always very deep and the lake bed can be very up and down. So if you're not careful, you can lose a lot of time investing in big sweeps, uh, pulling in big sweeps. But if you're pulling the net over sunken islands or any plateaus and gravel bars, then uh, you can lose fish. The, fish. the net's not gonna fish very effectively over those features. So uh, we spent some time with the owner, Adam, um, looking at so the, the topography, the, the lake bed map, to see, uh, see where these plateaus were, where the islands were and uh, really put the nets in areas that, where they're gonna fish effectively. And Adam also helped by feeding these areas where we could net effectively. While the nets were being loaded, Andy put his drone up to see what, to get some aerial shots and get an aerial view. Not only to see if we could find where there's more colored water, where potentially it's fish that are, is uh, making the water colored. So looking for fish, but not only that, also looking for any sunken islands, underwater features that we can avoid uh, when we shoot the net. So uh, very, had to be very strategic, but we knew we were gonna be up against it anyway, because they're, they're deep lakes. And with the added challenge of these underwater features, uh, we knew we were only gonna be sort of catching what we can to, to make a good assessment of the stock. Today, we are in the Wirral, and we are trying to catch fish where others have failed. We always like a challenge. Obviously, very undulating topography of this piece of water. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? Big words. Huh? Yeah, big words. And at the end of the day, we're going to put a lot of net in the water and just probably get snagged a few times, try and catch some fish. 
and um, Adam's done a great job building swims and making the place look good. Plenty of fish in here, but obviously it's like a mountain range underwater. Very, very deep, it's very, very shallow. So we've got to be very careful where we place the nets. Um, and then we're going to keep going until it gets dark and then go and get in a hot tub again. So this morning we are down at the Walden Estate near Salisbury. Um, Dave and Harry run a little cart plate down here for exclusive bookings and they've drained off nearly two foot of water to help get out juvenile fish and uh, we've been called in to, to net the lake and remove those fish, catch what we can. So uh, Andy's blocked off a long arm of the lake up the top, there's a few silvers topping and we're going to take out a few sections of uh, the bottom end of the lake where there's a couple of islands. It's, it's a bit up and down so we've shot nets into the deeper water and uh, Dave and, um, and Matt have spooked out the shallower areas into the deeper water. We've shot nets into deeper water so we'll have a few sweeps down here, catch what we can. But yeah, the saving grace is there's two foot of water off and there's good marginal parts around here so that would have brought all the juvenile silvers and stuff out into the open water where we can catch them. So fingers crossed we'll get a few out, make some space for the carp and uh, they'll continue to grow having been fed our feed uh, all through the summer they'll continue to grow this summer with a bit more room so uh, let's go and see how they're getting on Today was to take all the carp out we'd do it totally different we'd still do the sweeps we've done we would use uh, more nets as lanes to electrofish because the water's low it's perfect depth for electrofishing um, the majority of the carp are in these lily beds down here we know that because we've uh, netted it through here twice still catching fish and I'm having to pull the lead to almost saw it through the pads uh, we caught another eight fish just this side of the island after already dragging it through once. So we've caught over 50 carp now. There's supposed to be 100 in here. But like I say, we're here to try and catch small fish, which we're doing a good job of. And we've caught potentially half the carp stock. If, we, if the owners wanted to catch all the carp, we would still shoot all the nets, but then we'd set out for electrofishing and we'd lane it all off. And it's more labour intensive, but you would definitely catch all the carp. But most of them are sat in these pads here. Um, from experience they'll just be little craters in the pads where they're just sat and they won't move uh, but we don't need to catch them all we're catching good samples of fish the silver fish are easy to catch so basically using a combination of whatever methods are at, your, at your disposal on the day given the depth of the water and environmental factors and snags etc you just do the best job you can but if if, if these guys said to me well, I want to catch all the carp I could catch them all today without a doubt because now I could just reshoot the net lane it all off and just keep buzzing over these pads and carefully catching all the rest of the carp. Um, so yeah, basically if it's a cropping exercise, you're just trying to take as much net out as you can and crop small fish. 
you want to catch all the carp or as many carp as humanly possible it's much more labor intensive and you might want two days instead of a day on jobs like this but here with the water down we could carry on and catch carp now if we were electrofishing there's no point to be honest we've caught half a fish if there's a hundred in here and uh, they look really really good so that gives you a lot of information um, plus it doesn't really matter that we're not catching them all so you know it depends what the job is if the job's catch carp get the water down combination of methods job done Our next stop, we had to jump on a ferry and hop over to the Isle of Wight for the Isle of Wight Angling Club. and Pools, Isle of Angling Club. We came here last August and it was very hot. There's a video somewhere online, not a very good one because I did it. And uh, we did an awful lot of planting and reshaped some of the banks, took a lot of snags out. And the club carried that on when we left and they removed over in the back corner, as you'll see later, there's an awful lot of debris, just overgrown dogwoods and everything, all in the water. And the fish just held up there massively. We said, oh, I'd get all that out. So we planted an awful lot of made it a bit more uniform, just basically a match lake. And um, Danny's just said, which is really positive news for us, and it shows what we do is, is work it. And the fact that before we did any of the work, and this, we didn't do it till August, the average match weight for 400 pounds traditionally, um, total weight of fish caught, that sort of thing. Um, and then after August, when we did the, all the re redevelopment work and the club carried it on, did a lot of work themselves all over the back there, the average match weight was 700 pounds. That's with no extra stock in. And that is what we keep trying to explain to people. That you, there's lots you can do um, to increase your catch rates without putting additional fish in. In fact, a lot of the time in lakes like this, putting additional fish in has a detrimental effect. So that just goes to show, you know, just by doing some simple fishery management work, and yeah, it costs money to, to get us out here and to do the work, but the club have then carried that on. And that's the important thing. Rather than just go, I'll leave it, that'll be all right. They've carried it on all the way around the back and it's just moving the fish around and keeping them moving. So that's almost doubled some of the match weights by not putting any more fish in. This is uh, from the whole team to Dave on his birthday. Here, yeah, Dave. <coughs> well done. Birthday, Dave. Thank you. Uh, you can open it now. It's from all of us. Oh, thank you. Oh, show, show, show Ben. A wank clock. That's what I've always wanted for my birthday.
take these out. It's fantastic. Because, you know, it massively benefit the car. And, and everything else. Creating a lot of space yesterday by just removing some of the juvenile fish, um, made an awful lot of space in there. It's pointless putting the same weight back in, but the, the, obviously doing this lake here on Heron, which is predominantly a carp lake, there's some nice tension bits and pieces. By removing some of these bream out of here and putting them into there, you're benefiting this lake by making space, and you're also benefiting the lake we're going to put them in. So it's double whamp really. So instead of buying fish, you just move a few fish between the two lakes, which are right next to each other. Um, so yeah, benefited this by removing weight out of here so the carp can grow. Benefited that one by putting fish in there after we've created space. So it's basically a juggling game. You're never going to catch all the fish, so doing this every couple of years massively helps both lakes. That Isle of Wight job was really sort of a, a good advert for what we do. You know, we take take taking fish out of an overstocked lake, making loads of space so that there's less juvenile fish that are all using oxygen and putting pressure on water quality. Taking all those juveniles out because they're not going to get caught. They, they very, very rarely get caught. They just, you know, they use oxygen. They, they're keeping away out of out of the way of predators. They don't really see them. They don't really know that they're, that they're there. So you may as well take them out and replace them with fish like those big bream that we moved in there. Um, they may as well use fish like that that are going to feed, they're big, they're going to be active and looking for food, they're going to be very catchable and we took them out of a carp lake so they're no longer a nuisance to the carp anglers that are there to catch the carp um, and we've put them into lakes where they're going to be appreciated by match and pleasure anglers. And uh, also that bit of electrician footage, that's the first time I've been able to get on the boat and I've, I've been wanting to do it for a long time to be able to show you a bit about electrofishing. A lot of people always ask and show a lot of interest in electrofishing, how it works and uh, hopefully that given you, has given you a bit of an insight of, uh, of electrofishing. Um, it basically stuns the carp, they're, they're not harmed, they stay conscious but it's all in Andy's control. Andy's very, very experienced in all of that so uh, we set it up so that as soon as the carp is in that net, you want it to be conscious and, and you know moving and, and, and active. So uh, that's you could see in those footage if you go back, you'll see as soon as that fish is in that bin, it's come round and it's completely conscious. It's not like it's stunned because you can do damage to fish if you're using electrician equipment without experience. Really, you can use too much power and cause quite a lot of damage to the fish. So you need to be using it and have a lot of experience and you need to be using it responsibly, really, because at the end of the day, you're dealing with other people's fish. So there's something that we take very very seriously and Andy's always communicating with uh, whoever's on the probe and whoever's on the net and uh, the power's always off as soon as you stun a fish you'll see the power comes off the probe comes out of the water and the fish is in that net and, and recovering in that uh, holding bin so although it looks very uh, very aggressive and very quick and it is because that's we need to get those fish in that net it's just a quick survey and like we, we always say in all of our, our clips about Electrofishing is really only, you only use electrofishing when you can't use a net. So in those snags and those reed beds, we can't put a net in there. So we go in there with the electrofishing kit, have a, get a sample of what's in there, understand what's going on. And really, if you want to catch those fish, you need to drain that water out and get those fish out of those snags and uh, out of those reed beds in areas where you can't net them. So they're into areas where you can. And uh, that is, is just a tool for uh, the population work that we use. It's by no means uh, the only tool we use, we, we very, very rarely use it on its own, and it's, it's just a tool to, uh, to that complements netting really for a good survey. Um, so yeah, hopefully that given, has given you a bit of an insight, a bit, bit more about that. Um, it's, it's much more enjoyable than netting, but it's, it's not as productive. So we always use nets when we can. So um, we're coming into the spring now. So this has been a winter vlog. Um, so there's going to be less winter work now as we come into the spring. I'm going to be busier here in the mill. The orders are starting to pick up and as, as soon as the weather gets warm, the, the orders just go absolutely crazy. So it's, it's, I've got, got to be back in the mill more often now. So there's only a couple more jobs before uh, the winter work for me is finished and Andy will go on to do uh, different sort of groundwork jobs and summer work for fisheries, planting, things like that. So uh, this has been a winter vlog, so I hope you've enjoyed them and taken lots from them. I'm gonna try and keep the vlogs coming through uh, just a vlog what I do here at the mill, feeding fish and how I grow carp on the feeds that I do. But yeah, it's gonna take a different turn now into, uh, into sort of summer work. So hopefully you found lots of interesting content in the vlogs that we've made and uh, please carry on commenting, subscribing because we've got lots more lined up. 
informative content for you to enjoy and hopefully you learn a thing or two and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.